publicly say that at your daughter's wedding, but I would say to you, say that to your daughter along the way. Honor your wife in front of your daughter and speak things like that. Now again, women, you might be sitting here and saying, my husband couldn't say that to our daughter. Again, it's a new day. Begin today, living in such a way that your husband could say that to your daughter and she could follow in your example. Value her opinion in the gray areas, remembering she may not be wrong, but just different from you. This is often where a woman feels disrespected. And I have a friend who wrote in a Christmas letter a couple years ago this. Watching Stephen trial has provided a whole new appreciation for someone who has reached the top of their field of law. He always values my opinion and runs his arguments for trial by me. When I got her letter and saw those words, values my opinion, I thought, oh, that's exactly what we say at the conference. And I thought to myself, you know, she obviously feels esteemed and therefore loved, but this man must feel an awful lot of respect from this woman to, in order to do that. And I thought, it's the energizing cycle. His respect, her respect motivates his love, his love motivates her respect, and they are on that cycle. But men, because you're so bottom line with other men, and if you were with a friend and his you didn't agree with his opinion, you might just say, oh, that stinks, or oh, I don't agree with that. Well, there's somehow when you do that with a woman, it just doesn't quite make it. <laughs> so one day I was thinking, you know, what are, what are a couple ways that I could share with you ways in which you could say something that would be honoring to her, even if you didn't agree or that you thought you didn't agree. One of those would be just saying, thank you for sharing your opinion. That's very honoring. Or you could say, let me think about that, which shows you're processing her ideas. Thirdly, if you know for sure that you don't agree with her opinion, you could say this, even though I don't feel the same way as you, I value your opinion and I trust your heart. I think if I took a survey of the women in this room, they would probably agree with me that if either, any of those three things were said, we would feel loved and we would feel esteemed. Again, the way you word yourself and your tone of voice makes all the difference, just as it does with us, with you. Also, I would add, asking your wife's opinion. That is very, very loving and esteeming. So, that's it. Men, that's all you're responsible for. Again, I would just say to you, this is what the women said over and over and over again, so I would suspect that some of these things will probably work with your wife. You might ask your wife, would these things make you feel loved? Perhaps she would delete some of them and add some others. Either way, just begin trying them because I am convinced that they work. Okay, women, the next list is what you're responsible for. And again, this is what the men said over and over again. And what I'm about to share with you may feel foreign to you. Maybe the th I'm sure much of what Emerson has shared so far has felt foreign, but guess what? It's not alien to your husbands, and it's not alien to your sons. I am burdened today that women think marriage is all about them, and that if their needs are met, we'll all be happy. And the reason I say that is because I think I was guilty of that for so many years. But because the divorce rate continues to increase, Something must be missing, and I think, wouldn't it be exciting if we as women discovered what that missing ingredient was, began practicing it in our own lives, and we began making a difference in the world? Women are always talking about wanting power and influence, and I think, what a way to be influential and to be biblical at that. One of the reasons that we wrote the two books, Motivating Your Man God's Way, was because women were saying, what does respect look like? So the first book goes deeper into the issue of respect, and the second book is just practical things in how to make it a way of life. I had a woman call last year and say that she had discovered these books and that they had literally transformed her life and her marriage. She shared with me a little bit about her story and said that a couple years earlier, her husband had been caught in multiple acts of immorality. And in the last 20 months, they had been in Christian counseling, and no one had ever said the two words, unconditional respect to her. And she said even over those two years, or those 20 months, even though her husband had really grown spiritually and had made great strides, she says, I continued to be venomous with my words. And then she told me that she, she told me a situation that had just happened that week. And she said, I was so upset. She has this little accent. She goes, I was so upset with him. I was just going to bite into him. And then I thought, no. 
Emerson said, you can say what you have to say. You can say it respectfully. You do not have to crush his spirit. So she said, I came in, I said it, and then I walked out. And then pretty soon he started following me into the other room and he began loving on me. And he said, Angela, you remembered the book. <laughs> and she said, how did you know? He said, I heard it in your voice. Pretty powerful women. If these are what... These things are what men are feeling and what they have expressed. But again, because they're not as expressive, responsive as we are, then we need to listen. And we need to make a difference, not only in our lives, but in our culture. Again, God's asking us to unconditionally respect them for who he made them and for who he made your sons in the image of God, just as he made us with the needs that I just shared with your husbands. And those are the same needs that your daughter will have. He made us male and female, not wrong, not less, just different. I'm reminded of just before we began this ministry, I had been meeting with some high school girls for every Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock for two years. And at the end of my time, I thought, I'm going to run some of this love and respect by them. So I, one day I said, girls, tell me what you hate about guys. And they gave me a list of about 20 things, and you thought they'd been married for 20 years. It was incredible. Then I said, now, what do you love about being a woman? They said, oh, they just gave us this list of all these wonderful things about us. So the next week, I came back, and I said, okay, girls, now tell me what you respect about men and what you admire about them. They gave me another list that was so insightful, I was blown away. And I said, now tell me what you hate about being a woman. And then they told all those ugly things about us. So I said, okay, girls, tell me what you feel this week in comparison to last week. And one 18-year-old girl named Annie raised her hand, and she said, Mrs. Egrich, last week I thought we were the better species. This week I realized neither one of us is wrong. We are just different. I was so excited because I said, girls, if God chooses marriage for you and you get these concepts down now, you are going to have a very satisfying and fulfilling life. And I, that, that story still just amazes me. Again, he didn't make us married and unmarried. He made us male and female. And again, as I said, that's why I've shared some of the stories about my, my children. Okay, men, this is what, or women, this is what the men said under these different areas. Let's start with conquest. A man feels you are appreciating his pursuits or his desire to work and achieve and therefore feels your respect when you tell him thanks for going to work every day. Now, does that mean every day you say thanks for going to work today, thanks for going to work today? No. Too much cake makes anybody sick. <laughs> but ever so often, Thank him for going to work every day. Women say, you know, I've thought it, but I've just never said it. That's like a man saying, I think about telling her I love her. I just, you know, I just don't. Well, I had a friend who came to this conference by herself at the last minute because her husband works at the uh, university and was writing a grant proposal, and something happened on that Friday afternoon, and so he could not come, and it was going to be like another two weeks of crunch time. So after the conference, she just said, you know, God, I really want to put some of this respect stuff into practice. So she went home and decided that one thing she would do would... First of all, not complain. Second of all, that she would try to, or ask him not to do things that he would normally help her with, with the children. One of the things she did was she shoveled the driveway twice. We'd had two major snowstorms. At the end of those two weeks, that's my friend that got the card from her husband, thanking her for all the menial things that she does inside the home and outside the home. She also got flowers. Now, men or women, you're not always going to get flowers, as Emerson mentioned, but you will see him do something that you've probably wanted him to do. My friend did this to support her husband's work efforts, but guess what? Came back to show her love. Sounds like the energizing cycle again to me. Her respect motivated his love. His love motivates her respect. How do you want your future daughter-in-law to treat your son? I'm sure you want her to support his work efforts, or the daughter-in-law who's married to your son today. Next, cheer his successes, whether in business or sports. Remember in high school, you were there cheering somebody on, whether it's the guy sitting next to you right now or the whole team. We are just natural cheerleaders. And you know what? Those guys grow older, but that young man is still in there wanting us to cheer him on, but they're not going to say to us, cheer me on. You know, they just want it, though. I'm reminded of a friend of Emerson's who owned his own business in New York, and he had really looked forward to the day when he would be bought out. And that day finally happened, and he could hardly wait to get home and tell his wife. He came in the door. She was a little preoccupied. And so he said, honey, guess what? And she said, what? He said, it finally happened. She said, what? He said, they bought us out. It's, 
they, it's a done deal. We've sold the business. And she said, oh, that's great. And she went on doing what she was doing and never engaged him in that conversation. He said to Emerson, I felt so dishonored, I felt so disrespected, that I decided that day I would never share with her again. I thought, ooh, that's pretty serious. Because women, if we don't cheer them in, on in their successes, will we cheer them on when they fail? Throughout the years of pastoring, Emerson would, in his wedding ceremonies, would always use Ephesians 5.33 as the basis of his message. And he would tell the husband three ways to show love to his bride, and he would tell her three ways to show respect to her husband. And one of the things that he always said to the bride was, you be that cheerleader, that when the whole world walks out, you come in cheering him on. And I thought to myself, I love, I've always loved that word picture because it's who we are. We're cheerleaders. But we need to cheer them when they succeed, and we need to cheer them when they fail. Next one, ask him to talk about his dreams like you did when dating. This is often what we admired and respected them for. I can remember when Emerson and I were dating at Wheaton College, which seems some 5,000 years ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. I can remember walking along campus, and he would have a dream, and I'd go, really? And then the next week, it seemed like he had a new dream, and I'd go, really? Then a little while later, he'd have another dream, and I'd say, really? We're going to do that? And then guess what? We got married, and he continued to dream. But then I started going, really? <laughs> and then he'd have another dream, and I'd go, really? And then another one, I'd say, we're not going to do that, are we? And I remember one day when I said that, he said, Sarah, he said it lovingly, <laughs> he said, Sarah, I'm not going to do all these things. Just let me dream. And that was a real revelation to me that day, that men dream. And that's one way we can honor them by listening to their dreams. You know we want them to talk. That might be a good conversation getter, goal, to get going, saying, what are you dreaming about? Could you ever trust God to let your husband live out a dream? I had a friend who did this a couple years ago, and her husband wrote about it in their Christmas letter because he felt so honored and he felt so respected. She moved clear across the country to, to live out this dream. Last year, that dream failed because of the economy. That woman still, to this day, is his greatest cheerleader. And her daughter wrote about it in a high school paper. And I thought to myself, that mother is leaving that daughter a legacy that money could never buy. Hierarchy. A man feels you are appreciating his position as overseer or his desire to protect and provide and therefore feels respected when you really do look up to him for feeling responsible for you. I've seen this in my boys over the years, even, that there was just something there by God, this realization that I have, need to do something to, to be responsible, to provide. And it wasn't something we kept pounding into them all along the way. It's just that it was there, there by God. Second, when you tell him you are deeply touched by the thought that he would die for you. I am reminded of a few years ago when our son David was in college in California, and our daughter Joy was in high school, at, it was senior in high school, and it was her spring break. And David came to the conference that we were doing there in, in the LA area, and Joy stayed in the hotel room to um, catch up on the three hour jet lag. After the conference, we went back to the hotel room and knocked on the door, and she did not come. The television was up very loud, and so Emerson knocked again. She still did not come. By this time, I saw this concern come over his face because he walked around realizing that this was a ground floor hotel room and it was like a patio in the back and he noticed the sliding door open about this much. He came back and he looked at David and he said, David, I'm going to get the manager. If anybody comes through that door, you nail him. I thought, ooh, this is serious. I thought, they didn't ask me to nail him. I think they thought I'd probably be praying. <laughs> but what was very interesting that day was that I saw David do something, and it was, he didn't do this. No, Dad, no, Dad, don't make me do that. He put his shoulders back and he said, okay, Dad. And I realized that day that God had created my son to die for a woman. It was just amazing to me. And then you know what else was amazing? He was going to die for his sister. <laughs> if you told me that 10 years earlier, I'd said, I don't think so. <laughs> but... I was, I, was just so, I was just so touched by that. Now, as you know, she was not dead, but she was dead to the world. <laughs> and she wondered what all the commotion was about when the manager opened the door. She was in a real deep sleep. <laughs> 
When you praise his commitment to bring home the bacon, and I like to add here whether it's a little bit of bacon or it's a lot of bacon, you praise his commitment to bring home the bacon. Authority. A man feels you are appreciating his power on your behalf, meaning his desire to be strong, to lead, and make decisions, and therefore feels respected when you tell him he's strong as you squeeze his muscle. Women, touch your husband's arm right now. I guarantee you every one of them tightened up, right? <laughs> How did I know that? I just want you to know that last night I did not stand at the door and say to every man coming through, tomorrow there's going to be this time when I'm speaking and I want, I'm going to tell your wife to touch your arm and I want you to tighten up. No. So guess what? It has to be there by God. It's symbolic. It's, it's, it's a symbol of their desire to be strong for us and to lead us. And, and you know what? When my boys were four and five, I did not teach them to stand in front of the mirror and start going like this. <laughs> so guess what? It has to be there by God. And as much as there is on weight training for women today, when I touch Joy's arm, she does not tighten up. <laughs> Go figure. It's just, it's God. As simple as that. When you praise his decisions and minimize the criticism of the poor ones, women, they know if it's a poor decision, this is a really good time to exercise quietness that we read about in the Word. Number three, when you honor his authority in front of the kids and you differ in private. This shows huge respect. And again, like I've mentioned before, if you failed, just begin again. I love Lamentations. It says, his compassions are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Whether your children are small, you may think that they are, they don't, they're not aware. But guess what? Before you realize it, of habits have been formed and those children have grown. So whether your children are small or whether they're grown, I would just say to you women, go to them and seek their forgiveness. Children are very forgiving. Ask God's forgiveness. He will honor that. Ask your husband's forgiveness. He will feel respected. And guess what? He'll be able to drop it. He'll be able to forget it. He'll be able to move on. Oh, what an honorable quality. He won't need to talk about it for two or three days. He will be able to let it go. We are blessed to have that trait in our husbands. I am reminded of a woman who came to a conference, one of our conferences, and she was married to a, very, uh, a man who was in a very significant ministry position. She came up to me with tears in her eyes, and she said, I have so undermined my husband's authority over the years that I was so convicted when you shared that today. So she said, at the end of the conference, I turned to my husband and I sought his forgiveness. Then I turned to my newly married daughter, and I sought her forgiveness. And I only have two kids to go. And I thought, there's a woman who's going to, she's going to move on. She's going to do what she needs to do. It's a powerful thing, women. In fact, I want to read you an email that came to us recently, and this is what this woman said. I recently read your book and wish it had been written 20 years ago. My husband and I have three grown sons. For the first time, I realized why they often reacted so negatively when I disrespected their dad. As I look back at times of verbal disrespect towards my husband, I now understand why my sons would at times visibly wince and come angrily to his defense. They understood what I did not. Respect is vital to men. I hope you will explain to the women at your conferences that a woman's lack of respect toward her husband has negative effects not only on him, but on the other men in the house as well. I am making a point of praising and respecting my husband in front of our sons, and all four of them are standing taller. Pretty powerful. It works. That's all I can continue to say. <clears throat> Under the area of insight, a man feels you appreciate his perspective and his proposals or his desire to analyze and counsel, and therefore feels respected when you thank him for his advice and knowledge. Don't say you're always trying to fix me. See it as there by God. Next, let him fix things and applaud his solution orientation. I loved it in what we thought was an emergency situation in that hotel room in California. I loved it when my husband and my son took over. We like it when they fix things around the house. Now, not every man is a fix-it man, but I bet every man in this room can fix a flat tire, and I would be so happy if I had a flat tire and you came along to fix my tire. I am concerned about the male bashing that goes on in the church and outside the church. I think it's very interesting that we have given women license to just say things about men and about our sons. And you know why I think it happens? Because we see men as so strong. And men don't personalize. 
They laugh. They just let it go. But guess what, women? We are bashing God's creation. And if we don't change something, it will continue to only get worse, and it will be more towards your sons. So I just want to challenge you that if you're in a conversation where men are being bashed, hopefully you'll be more aware of it now, but because it's, we, people just do it. And hopefully you will either change the course of that conversation or you will remove yourself from that conversation. But if we as godly women do not see this as sin and do not start doing something about it, then it's not going to change. And somehow we've got to change it. I think it's very interesting that we can have a television show on in this country where four women can bash men for an hour, but we could never have a television show where four men were bashing women. And we say there's equality? I don't think so. Tell him up front you need an ear to listen and not a solution which shows him you value his ability to listen and you aren't making him guess. And he'll feel respected. It's just as simple as that. Okay, under the area of relationship, a man feels you are appreciating and valuing his partnership and his pastimes or his desire for a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder friendship and thus feels respected when you tell him you like him. A few years ago, I noticed an ongoing tension in my relationship with Emerson, and I really couldn't put my finger on it until one day we were talking, and he looked at me and he said, Sarah, I know you love me, but I do not think you like me. And I thought, oh, Tonto, take your arrow. He was right. I didn't like him. I didn't like my children. You know, if you ask my friends to tell you about me, they, most of my friends would probably say, she's positive, she sees the glass half full and not half empty. It's just the way she looks at life. But guess what? I was not being that way in my home. I'm a pretty friendly person, but I was not being friendly in my home. I was complaining about everything. I was complaining from every shoe left from the front door to the back door, every crumb on the counter, every candy wrapper on the floor, every wet towel left on a bed or a floor. And I just continued on and on, thinking that if they all did it my way, we'd all be happy. I was out to change them, because I thought my way was the best way. And guess what? Nobody was happy, not even me. Well, when Emerson said that, I thought, wow, Lord, is this you speaking to me? I had been asking God, and I began thinking, maybe he's speaking to me through this. I was getting ready to go visit my mother at the time, and Joy was going with me, and Emerson was going to stay home with the two boys. And so I said, Lord, while I'm away, continue to speak to my heart about this. And you know what? If you ask God to speak to you and you're willing to listen, he will continue speaking. While I was away, he reminded me that Emerson and I didn't get married because we hated each other. I hate you, you hate me, so let's get married. No, it wasn't, didn't go down like that. We got married because we were first friends, and then as we continued to grow in our friendship, we realized that we loved and respected one another, and we wanted to spend the rest of our life together. And I was friendly, but guess what? I was no longer friendly. So the Lord challenged me to go home and to be the friend that he had met at Wheaton College so many years ago and to continue being that friend to him and being friendly in our home. So I came home with that as my mission. And when I arrived at the airport, he was there to greet us. And I said, so how was your time? He said, it was good. I said, did you miss me? And he said, oh, you know, we had so much fun while you were gone. We played games. We watched TV. We did rented videos. We, we built forts. We ate when we wanted to eat. We made the beds when we wanted to make the beds. I thought they made that bed just before I got here. <laughs> but anyway, as you noticed when I said, did you miss me? He didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. But that was the last confirmation that I needed. And I was excited about it. I was excited to be what God had asked me to be and who I knew that I was. Something happened during that time. A word picture came to me during that week. And it was this, that when I get to heaven, God's probably not going to say, so Sarah, were you successful in changing everybody to be like you? No, he's probably going to say, Sarah, how did you change to become like me? And you know, that's my goal in life, is to be like Jesus. And that's, that's my desire. Now, have I, ever become, have I ever been negative since then? Oh, yeah. I was negative this week, but guess what? I first of all see it as sin. I go there, but I don't stay there. I leave it really quick. And so, this was a life-changing experience for me, and a real turning point in my life, not only with Emerson, but also 
with God. What about your sons? How do you want your future daughter-in-law or the one that's married to them today to treat them? I'm sure you see him as a good-willed little boy or a good-willed young man. And I am sure that you want her to be friendly in their home. Ask yourself, am I being friendly in my home so that my daughter-in-law could follow my example? It's as simple as that. Do recreational activities with him or watch him do them? And might I add doing these shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder activities without... And I said, without always talking about the children. Now, I thought that any time two people, normal people, got together, you talked. I mean, isn't that what people do if they're alone? Don't they just talk? And uh, so one day, Emerson and I were together talking, and he looked at me and he said, Sarah, do you think we could get together sometime and not always talk about the children? And he said it lovingly and just very matter-of-factly, and I kind of looked at him like, you know, he does have another life. And I knew he didn't have anything against our kids. He was an awesome dad, not only to my children, but all the children in the neighborhood. In fact, when the children in the neighborhood came to our door, they didn't ask for my kids to come out and play. They asked if Mr. Egrich could come out and play. <laughs> I'd say, sure, he's been a good boy. We'll let him out today. So I knew that wasn't the issue. But it was just that, you know, maybe we could discuss something else. Like I said earlier, we want him to talk, so maybe we could ask him, what do they dream about? But again, with these shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder activities, another thing that I learned, as Emerson mentioned, was to not talk at all. Now, that was a novel idea for me. And uh, so one day, a few years back, I, I was thinking, I'm, I'm gonna in, I want to enter in this discipline with, with my oldest son, Jonathan. We were getting ready to go on a vacation, family vacation. There were five of us, three different vehicles, five different schedules. So I was going to be riding with him in his truck. Now, he's a man of very few words. So I thought, well, this will really be a test for me. But anyway, my sons grew up with this mother who had 20 questions, always. I was always trying to get them to come out of themselves, to tell me what they were feeling, tell me what they were thinking. They would never got quite as excited about it as I did. So I really wish that I had learned this concept in the fifth grade. Not when I was in the fifth grade, but when our son David was in the fifth grade, because I remember so distinctly picking him up from school in the fifth grade. First day of school, I said, David, how was your day? And he said, good. I said, what'd you do? He said, nothing. That was a little disconcerting. But then I said, anything exciting happened? And he said, no. Second day, I said, David, how was your day? And he said, good. And I said, what'd you do? Nothing. Same thing. Third day, I said, David, how was your day? Good. What'd you do? Nothing. Fourth day, fifth day, David, how was your day? Good. What'd you do? He said, mom, it's the same every day. If anything changes, I'll let you know. So I said, hmm, that's why I wished I'd learned it in the fifth grade. Just maybe if I'd learned to ride along with my boys, shoulder to shoulder, not asking 20 questions, just maybe they might have started talking. Back to my truck story and the vacation. I want you to know that miracles still happen. I rode in this truck for three and a half hours and said nothing, except should we turn here, should we get gas, and should we turn on the air conditioning? I remember those three things to this day because that is all that was said. When we arrived at the vacation spot, Jonathan did not turn to me and say, Mother, thank you so much for riding shoulder to shoulder with me and not saying anything. That just energized me greatly. No, he didn't say that. But when I reflected on that vacation, it was one of the most, that was one of the best family vacations we'd ever had. And I thought, maybe, just maybe, I set the tone for it by just riding in that truck knowing that he didn't have a need to have major conversation, but I was just there beside him. Now, what I didn't realize at the time, that it was preparing me for a project that I would do with him about a year and a half later when he bought a little bank foreclosed home to fix up for resale. And he asked me if I would help him during the week when we were not doing conferences. And I got so excited about doing this because I thought to myself, he just needs me there, shoulder to shoulder, not having an agenda, and just to be there to keep him going until it, it finishes. And that was just, it was so energizing to me, realizing I don't have to be thinking of all these things to be talking about, blah, 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 blah. Well, anyway, one day I got a surprise. I, like I said, I didn't go into this with any expectations of receiving anything. I was just excited to help him. I was out scraping the garage and the plumber had come and he just happened to go to our church and when he saw me up there on the ladder scraping this garage he said to Jonathan whoa you got your mom here helping how much does she cost and without hesitation he said she's priceless man a few words that one word lasted me for a long time I have kept it and treasured it in my heart <laughs> but 
that was such a, like I said, that was such a treat. And then I had a friend who, a gal who heard me share this one day, and she wrote me this note afterwards. She said, one thing you touched on especially spoke to me about having a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationship. Often when we drive, Keith does not speak. I have tested him to see how long it would continue.